Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's the third event of Wharton School Press's Meet the Authors series. I'm Pete Fader. I'm just so delighted to have a chance to talk to so many of my colleagues about their books. So not that you care about me, but I'm the Francis and Paywad Cha Professor of Marketing at the Wharton School. I've written a couple of Wharton School Press books myself, but we're not here to talk about me Today, we're here to talk about Katie Milkman. She's the, the third of our the four folks that we're gonna be uh, talking to. Uh, earlier in January, I spoke to my colleague, Michael Platt, about his book, The Leader's Brain. And then in March, my marketing colleague, Jonah Berger, discussed his book, The Catalyst. Today, it's Katie Milkman time. And then join us again next month, June 15th, when Mauro Guillen is gonna talk about two of his books, 2030, as well as his brand new book from Wharton School Press, the Platform Paradox. But today in the spotlight is Katie Milkman, who's the Jamie Dynan Professor at the Wharton School. She's a, a, a professor in our uh, Operations, Information and Decisions Department with a secondary appointment at, at Penn's uh, Perlman School of Medicine. Very, very appropriate because her research really focuses on, on ways that we can use different concepts, methods, frameworks from economics and psychology to harness consequential changes uh, to our behavior for good, not just trying to get people to buy more stuff that they don't necessarily need, like we do in marketing. Uh, so she actually runs a, a center at Penn about uh, change for good. It's been just, just incredibly impactful, relevant, interesting. And I think a lot of that work is reflected in her book, How to Change. Uh, and we, I'm, while I have the, the, the wonderful privilege to talk to Katie, uh, we really would love to get questions, comments from all of you as well. So please chime into the chat. Your questions will be better than mine, but I'm going to do my best. Katie Milkman, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Uh, it, it's, it, it's such a pleasure. Uh, as we said, but before we went on air here, uh, I just love to read my colleagues' books, but it's especially nice when I get a, take a, a deeper dive to really think about it in order to have a conversation like this. So let's get right into it. So the, you know, the first natural question would be, so what, what made you write this book? You've been doing a lot of research in this area for a while. Um, what was the, 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 the main thing to, to bring it all together and to kind of take out all the time to write a book, which is a fairly consequential behavior by itself. The catalyst to reference the uh, <laughs> previous book that you That's right. spoke about. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think I was always preparing to write this book. I just didn't quite know it. So when I was a graduate student, I was studying engineering and started doing some research, trying to figure out how to get myself to be more productive and, and more effective in life, more able to get myself to the gym, for instance, when I was struggling. Um, that got me going on a little bit of research around behavior change. And then actually when I got here to Penn, I went to a talk at the Perlman School of Medicine that really changed the course of my career. It was a talk with a graph I know a graph changed my life and made me write this book, but the graph um, was a pie chart showing the fraction of premature deaths that are due to behaviors that could be changed and due to other causes as well. And that behavior change wedge was dramatically larger than expected. It was 40%. 40% of premature deaths are due to decisions we make about what we eat, whether or not we move, um, what we drink, whether we smoke, and whether we make good decisions about vehicle safety. And that just boggled my mind. And it made me realize that the work I'd been doing that was sort of, you know, me search, <laughs> trying to figure out things that, that worked to help me make better decisions had the potential to be so much more impactful than I had appreciated and that needed to be my focus. So I really pivoted to studying um, behavior change for good. And I realized not only in the domain of health, that's one area, but also savings and educational outcomes are other areas where you can see how those cumulative decisions can matter so much. And then it, it was a really natural next step once I felt like we had a body of knowledge that was worthy of sharing to write the book so that we could get the science out there to a wide audience so that so we could start making a dent in that wedge. And in terms of uh, organizing your thoughts, I, I just even, even this the the simple like one word chapter headings of, of, by themselves are, are provocative, and I think do a pretty good job of of, of organizing, of framing all the, the research. So you want to just give us just a, a quick run through the table of contents? Oh no, pop quiz! Now the question is, can I remember my table of contents? <laughs> <laughs> I can, I think. Um, let me first explain the organization, which is one of the things that I've discovered in my career, both working with 
individuals and organizations is that over and over again, um, I think a mistake is made around trying to encourage change, which is not to try to figure out what is the obstacle that you're overcoming? And that we want to use really different tactic depending on the internal obstacle to change, whether it's um, to that temptations are standing in the way, whether it's hard to get started and so on. So the chapters are organized around different concepts that I've seen as common obstacles to change. And then they they flash, you know, tell stories and flesh out the science that can help with those obstacles. So it begins with um, the getting started problem. Actually, I feel like I should check. Yeah. <laughs> it with the You're right. I'm, problem. I'm with you. I'll confirm. <laughs> then uh, turning to impulsivity and procrastination, which are really very closely related. Uh, forgetting, which, you know, there's a debate with my editor as to whether we should call it forgetting or flake out, but uh, the things that aren't top of mind and salient and that we sometimes fail to do because we're just not focused enough on them. Um, we also sometimes don't make change because we don't uh, have the right habits. So that's sort of laziness or the right defaults and inertia. So laziness is another one of the barriers that I talk about. Um, and I also talk about confidence, which is funny because so so often we're overconfident, but when we're underconfident, it can be a barrier to change as well. And then conformity, which you know relates to your social network, how you've structured that, whether or not people are shaping your decisions for the better or worse who are around you. And then I end with the discussion of making change last. Right. So, you know, it's funny, we both made reference to, to Jonah Berger's recent book, the, the, the Catalyst, which is really more about making changes in others. So can you tell us a little bit about how much of the book applies you know, strictly to yourself versus others uh, versus both? Yeah, it's. Uh, I'd say it's actually probably 60% uh, focused on, on self change. And I was just tweeting back and forth with Richard Thaler, who is one of the you know people whose work I build on in the book. He and Cass Sunstein wrote a, a brilliant book called Nudge about a decade ago that also really had a huge impact on my research. And um, he was saying, I think this book, this is like the self nudge book. It's it's snudging. <laughs> I'm glad that I didn't hear that before I chose the title. I don't think snudging was meant to be. But I like that characterization. Of course, all of my research is done with organizations that are trying to encourage behavior change at the individual level. And so the research I'm citing is about encouraging change in others for the most part. But uh, the lens in the book is largely, these are tools and tactics that can help you be more effective yourself. And also, I always tried to lay out in every chapter, if you're a manager, a coach, a teacher, these are the ways you can use these insights to help other people. But I, but I wanted to have, I wanted to offer tools the reader could use for self-improvement that are based in science instead of guruism. Yeah, so other times when there is potential conflict where the advice might be different if it's a snudge versus a nudge uh, for yourself versus someone else? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I actually think there's an amazing amount of overlap in the two, and that's part of why I was excited to write this book, um, especially because uh, I guess one place where the two diverge was it has to do with making things fun. And this was an interesting exploration for me because I had not I've never really studied gamification, which is really the way an organization tries to make it more fun to pursue your goals. Um, I've studied the ways individuals can find fun, and I've you know read a lot about wonderful research by others on this topic. And it turns out one of the biggest mistakes we often make when we're trying to pursue our goals is trying to just sort of push through and do it the most effective way instead of finding a way to make it instantly gratifying. We may talk a little bit more about this later, but when an organization tries to make it fun for you to be productive, for instance, that tends to look like gamification and it can actually backfire. So our colleagues in the management department, uh, Nancy Rothbard and Ethan Mollick have done some really nice research on how if you feel manipulated by your, you know, an organization, they did a study with salespeople where the organization was trying to get the salespeople to be more productive and they made it into a game um, to, to score sales a lot of people didn't buy in. They felt like it was mandatory fun and that backfired. So I do think that there are some edge cases where the same principles, I mean, the same principle applies in that if your employer can make it more fun for you to achieve your goals, you're more likely to pursue them. But some of the tactics that you'd think would naturally do that are more likely to backfire due to reactants when it's a nudge rather than a snudge. <laughs> Yeah, no, very I can't interesting. I'm using that term. Yeah, I know. But maybe you should probably, you know, go out there and you know buy that word snudge.com. It's going to be worth something one day. So, 
Um, but just one, one more question on, on this dimension. Um, what about, you know, if, if we learn how to change ourselves or how to change others, um, what about lessons to not be a sucker, to not get caught up in that? Because you know, a, l- a lot of times, uh, one of the, the problems that we'll face is trying to get people to uh, no longer binge or to no longer uh, do some of the things that, uh, that that might be helpful to get you into something in the first place. You know, how do we reverse it? Does, does, does that come up at all? Meaning? You know, to, to, to get, so, so for instance, like one of the things that you talk about in the book is the idea of, of pennies a day, that, that mm-hmm. whole concept that, that you know, if, if we can just, uh, whether it's it's a good thing we're doing for ourselves or, or giving right. money to charity, if we just do it, you know, small, well, you, you talk about that first. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, this is, there's wonderful research by, uh, how, led by Hal Hirschfeld at UCLA that I just love that was done with Acorns, uh, a savings app, um, where they invited people to start saving and they just reframed the question. Either would you like to save $5 a day or $35 a week was one framing or 150 a month, which of course all are exactly the same decision. But what they found is a dramatically higher rate where people said, oh, yes, I, I would like to do that when they framed it as $5 a day. And in research with my own PhD student led by Anish Rai, who's a student here at Wharton, we found similar effects um, trying to encourage volunteering and productivity, which is a very different kind of behavior. It's not a one and done. It's actually you know continually showing up and doing it when uh, a nonprofit framed your volunteering commitment to them, not as 200 hours a year, which you signed up and said, yes, I'll do that, but reframed and said, you know, try for four hours a week or eight hours every two weeks. They saw an 8% increase for months in the rate at which people actually fall through on those commitments. So this simple trick of thinking about the the short-term commitments, making it more bite-sized can be really helpful in, in getting us over the hump to achieve some of our goals. So what happens when people are trying to do that to you and not necessarily for good? So, you know, a late night infomercial that is going to say pennies Just a day. Just $2 for Exactly. Yeah. So, so how, on one hand, can you find some of these nudges, nudges to be effective, but also to be able to defend yourself when they're being used against you? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. And, you know, unfortunately, I think that just being aware of it does not seem to be enough that we always can fend it off. You know, this isn't something I focus on in the book because the book is really aimed at a reader who's trying to figure out how to help themselves and help others. And I actually really love the advice of Robert Cialdini, who wrote one of, I think, the greatest books of all time on influence. He wrote his book in a way that um, described positive uses of influence and you know talked about how do we use it to encourage people to be more environmentally conscious and so on and and in so doing hoped and and all pointing out that these can be used as tricks hope that he was guiding people towards using them ethically but it is you know knowledge is power and it can be weaponized and, right. and there's that's a that's a challenge yes indeed now a, a point that you, you you made in passing uh was talking about in in, in your chapter on uh, impulsivity um, you you point out that you know that iconic phrase "just do it" uh, might not be as effective as people might think, and that you know a, 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 a spoonful of sugar might <laughs> help the medicine go down more effectively. So, okay, can you expand on that? Yeah, absolutely. And I do think Mary Poppins sort of you know has it all right, and we maybe should recognize the the inner kid never goes away. Um, This is actually an insight that came from research by Ayelet Fishbach at the University of Chicago and Caitlin Woolley at Cornell University, who have done, I think, just brilliant research showing we have a fundamental mistake we make when we're pursuing some new goal. That, you know, if you take someone to the gym or you get them started on a diet or a a study goal, most people's intuition is, I'm going to look for the most effective way to pursue this goal. So at the gym, I'm going to go for the maximally efficient Stairmaster and burn as many calories as I can or, you know, study in the the most distraction free, intense environment I can find or eat the kale salad with, you know, without dressing for my diet. And what they found is actually if you encourage people to look for a fun way to pursue your goals instead of the most effective way. Um, people do better. So they, you know, choose a Zumba class and maybe don't burn as many calories per minute at the gym and they go with a friend or they, you know, choose the smoothies instead of the kale salad. Uh, they 
they do their work with some music in the background and, and some snacks. They may not be quite as effective in the moment, but they persist. And so, so Katie, can you tell us about uh, areas where, uh, like this, building on this kind of just do it example, where, where the research tells us uh, uh, ideas that are just very different than conventional wisdom? Maybe my favorite study that surprised me, and it, by the way, it was different than, than not just conventional wisdom, but wisdom in the research community too, was a study about habits and how to best form durable habits that I did with um, John Bashirs and a former Wharton doctoral student, Rob Mislavsky and, and Sunny Lee, also a Wharton PhD student, uh, and Jesse Wisdom. We all teamed up on this project with Google. And the goal was to figure out if we could create lasting workout habits. And, and by the way, I should say, I'm not particularly interested in workout habits, nor were my collaborators, but exercise habits are something that we often study when we're interested in habits generally. It's like the fruit fly of habits, because you can see a repeated behavior someone's trying to engage in and a measured objectively. So we did this study with 2,500 Google employees or Googlers as they're called who signed up and said, I wanna kickstart an exercise habit. And we randomly assigned them to two critically important conditions. One group was given um, instruction and encouragement to visit the gym at a really consistent time every day for, for a month. So not, they probably didn't, they definitely didn't come every day, but when they went, they're getting rewards for going at that same time. And the idea is if you go at the same time over and over again, it will create a habit around that cue and that time and it'll be sticky. And at the end of the month, we'll have built this lasting durable habit. Okay, we compared that with a second group that also chose a time that was best for them and got reminders to go at that time, but they were rewarded and encouraged for going whenever they wanted. And what we ended up with was two groups, one of which went about half the time at the same time of day and the other went 85% of the time at this consistent point in time. And we were really sure that that consistency would build habit and we were wrong. Hmm. What we found is that the group that had had a more flexible approach to exercise built a more durable habit. And the, what, what we saw when we looked at the data was the people who had formed those rigid habits, they did go a little bit more after the end of the program at that consistent time, the time that they had picked and had gone to the gym at that time always. But if they missed that time, it was a brittle habit. They didn't go at all. The other folks, they went pretty consistently actually at their best time. But if they missed their, say, 7 a.m. workout, which was the usual, they would slip in a noon workout or maybe a 5 p.m. workout. So they had, had built a flexible habit or an elastic habit, and it wasn't so brittle. And it turns out that's really important because life throws us lots of curveballs and gets in the way. And once we had this data, you know, I felt like, oh, my God, how could I have had the wrong model all along? But, you know, that, that's why it's so valuable to collect this kind of evidence, because sometimes it pokes holes in the theories we've become fond of. That's fantastic. And that's why it's valuable to to, to not just rest on your laurels and say, you know, here are the the, the, the 10 heuristics to follow, but but you got to always be out there uh, collecting data, uh, you know, adjusting hypotheses and, and looking for some of the, these boundary conditions. You know, and with this in mind, I want to start moving into questions. I, I want to hear you talk a bit about the center that, that you're running over at Penn. And, and actually, let me work our way into it with a, a question posed by someone off Instagram saying, um, how can we change our mindset when we feel that we're too small to really make a difference? Mm, such a good question. And I, I would put this sort of into this uh, category of confidence and self-efficacy. Uh, I think there's a couple of things that that are particularly useful. And by the way, I should point out, I'm like looking at my bookshelves above me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull out a wonderful book. <laughs> there we this go. This is a book um, called Mindset by Carol Dweck that really addresses this and I highly recommend it. Um, and talks about the importance of, you know, recognizing failure as growth opportunities and how much mindset and belief can change our outcomes. Uh, and I write about that in the book too, but this book is completely devoted to it and it's, it's fantastic. Uh, a couple of things. One I, thing I think you can do to change is think about um, social strategies. So are you surrounding yourself with people and can you find peers who will show you what's possible and who inspire you? Now, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, like you don't want to befriend Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, if the gap is too large, there's research showing it actually can be demotivating. In fact, there's a really interesting study I cite in the book about how having a college roommate who performs better than you generally lifts your performance as a freshman. But if you have a giant gulf 
Uh, in fact, there was a strategic study done trying by Scott Carell and collaborators at the Air Force Academy where they tried to um, engineer roommate assignment and put superstars with low performers to lift the low performers. And it actually backfired because the gulf was so large, there was no opportunity for learning. But in general, if you can find peers and surround yourself with other people who have similar goals and are showing you it's possible and they're sort of a little ahead of you on the path, that can be really effective because we learn from other people and we we start to believe in ourselves more when we see what people like us can achieve. Another insight in the book and from research by former uh, Wharton postdoc Lauren Eskris Winkler and myself and, and Angela Duckworth, who's also a professor here, shows that actually when we're put into the role of advice giver, meaning we offer advice to our peers that can improve our own outcomes by boosting our confidence and our belief in ourselves. When, when we see ourselves as a role model, um, we believe we can accomplish more. We dredge up insights we might, might not otherwise have thought of. And then once we've said it to someone else, we don't want to be hypocritical. So I, I talk in the book a little bit about forming advice clubs, which is related to this social idea I just talked about. If, if you have peers who have similar goals and you can all advise each other, they come to you for tips, you go to them for tips, you get both their insights about what works that you can emulate and you get the confidence boost that comes from them asking you and you realizing, hey, I do have something useful to mm -hmm. contribute and say here, and I'm going to walk the talk. That is great. I love it. And another really interesting question from Michael on LinkedIn. So what are the differences in the approach and the likelihood for success between endeavoring to change a habit versus uh, trying to adjust more fundamental elements of personality? So, you know, just, just, you know, starting to do better stuff versus becoming, you know, someone different. Yeah. Becoming a completely that? different kind of person. It's so interesting. Um, First of all, I should say I have zero training in personality psychology, so I'm not I'm not well suited to answering questions about about change on that dimension. Most of the book and my research is about individual decisions as opposed to personality change. But uh, but my sense is that that would be a, that's a harder it's a harder hill to climb. Uh, and and so instead, I guess I would argue rather than focusing on trying to change who you are, try to change what you're accomplishing and what you're able able to do. Uh, I think that's that's something we have good evidence is possible. And that leads me to ask about <coughs> the cover, the, the cover, because I, I look at, at this, this wonderful metaphor over here. There's the pigeon and there's the swan. Um, do we worry about um, uh, suggesting to pigeons that they could become swans? Is there something potentially, you know, misleading, dangerous about that? that tell, tell us about the metaphor, but more importantly, the, the, the broader real world advice on it. Yes. And excuse my cough. I'm <laughs> happily healthy, just a little bit of a, um, allergies this morning. <coughs> um, that cover was such an intense debate with uh, with my publisher, and I I'm glad I came around. I really do I do love the pigeon swan, but it took me a while because I'm a very literal person. And when I first looked at it, I said, "Doesn't this suggest the promise of the book is a false promise because the pigeon can't become a swan? Is it all false hope?" And and my uh, the head of my publishing house sort of very kindly and poetically explained that it was a metaphor and that the pigeon is looking at something more beautiful and trying to become a, a greater version of itself and that it's about aspiration and that's really what the book is trying to offer is that actually science can help us with our aspirations it doesn't just have to be a dream or a vision of something more beautiful or something better we can become or the goals that we have or the goals we try to help others achieve but there is evidence there's a basis in evidence for achieving our aspirations and that uh, I want to, that's why I wrote the book to put that out there. And I think, anyway, I'm happy with the cover <laughs> when, I, when I don't have very literal moments. <laughs> so, so I want to hear about Katie Milkman's aspirations. So again, writing a book is a, is a, is a big step. Uh, I'd, I'd love for you to, to spend a minute or two talking about the, the center that you run over at Penn and just what, what you're hoping to accomplish through the work that you're doing and over the next few years. Yeah, the uh, the Behavior Change for Good initiative is very closely intertwined with this book and the effort. And uh, Angela Duckworth, who wrote the foreword of my book, is the co-director of the center and is amazing, author of the bestseller Grit, which I highly recommend to everyone. Um, and, and actually, by the way, speaking of personality, that's more of a character dimension. Um, our aspiration with the center is really just to supercharge the science of behavior change. And the book, in a way, was a culmination of all the things I've learned from running the center over the last five years, 
pulling together about 150 of the world's greatest scientists thinking about behavior change in all different disciplines to do this kind of work. What we specialize in at Behavior Change for Good at that initiative that I co-direct is what I'll call mega studies. These are uh, very large studies that look sort of like a tournament where we'll go out to a team of scientists, 150 of them actually, and say, here's a problem. We're gonna run a field experiment and we wanna do a really big test, not of one hypothesis or two, but dozens side by side. We've now done uh, tests with 24 hour fitness to try to figure out what are the tools and techniques we can use to encourage exercise habits, where we tested dozens of ideas simultaneously developed by all different uh, teams of scientists. And also and very relevant to the present moment, we've been trying to contribute to the efforts on uh, encouraging vaccination. We saw this moment coming last year actually, and set up tournaments uh, in partnership with Walmart pharmacies and Penn Medicine and Geisinger Health, two local health systems, and ran two of the largest studies that have ever been run, encouraging people to get vaccines. We did it in the fall 2020 flu season using messaging that we felt would be portable and similar, would work similarly for flu and COVID-19 vaccines, and have just published our first results. The, the, uh, we found that simple text messages reminding people to come to get a vaccine when they were seeing a doctor already or to come into the pharmacy were very effective and across the board and the best performing messaging in all three settings, even though we tested very different things in their very different contexts, just conveyed that a vaccine is reserved or waiting for you, implying that it was a default, which is one of the things I talk about in the chapter on laziness. It, it, it's so easy, it's already been set aside for you, your name's on it, you don't have to think about it any further, come on in and we're seeing lots of, uh, of application of those ideas. I just saw New York City's mayor's office actually tweet over the weekend based on our work a vaccine is, you know, to tourists, vaccine is waiting for you when you visit New York City. So mm -hmm. uh, we're, you know, trying to advance the science of behavioral change in leaps and bounds by doing this um, very large tournament style work. That's great stuff. It really is. And again, it's, it's, it's so impactful, but it's also so interesting. And that's why even just at, at a micro level, just, just hearing some of the, these stories and some of the surprises, uh, it's just so, so great of you to, to take some time. I know you've been super busy uh, between your, your research, running the center, writing and promoting a book. Uh, so, so Katie, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time with us and for joining us. Uh, great things to come for you and for your center uh, and for the school as a whole. So Katie, thank you. Thank you for having me. This was so fun, Pete. Uh, it, it, it always is a pleasure talking to Katie. And and for the rest of you who, who don't have the pleasure of talking to Katie Milkman down the hallway every day, you wanna go out and buy a copy of this book. That, that's the best uh, right there, and it, and it really is good. It's available through the, the Wharton School Press bookstore as well as, well, any place you buy a book because it's, uh, it's it's really catching on quite well. And we'd love you to stay updated about all the different books and things that a lot of the Wharton faculty are doing, whether they're through, through Wharton School Press or, or through through other, other sources, but we all bring it together at Wharton School Press. So I encourage you to hit that website, to learn about other books that colleagues are writing, other ones that are coming soon, and other kinds of events and content that, that the school is, and, and my colleagues are just uh, so so good at creating. So, so with that, I'm gonna sign off, but we're gonna see you on June 15th when we pick up the conversation with Mauro Guillen. Thanks very much. <laughs>